archaeological survey has a a, a long history uh, in uh, in in Britain certainly, um, and I'm just going to look briefly at uh, some of the more recent um, aspects of that. Uh, the quotation in my title is, of course, from O.G.S. Crawford, one of the great practitioners of archaeological survey in the 20th century. He was puzzled uh, as to why archaeological survey as undertaken in Britain was so rarely and so differently undertaken on the continent. Now, this is not a question that we're particularly going to address today, but it's one that's worth bearing in mind. He was thinking of the sorts of surveys undertaken by Herbert Toms, of which you uh, see a, an example here, uh, one at Ladies Mile on the South Downs, which constitutes what we would now call landscape archaeology, but which was then simply called field archaeology. Delineating historic features by direct observation and measurement. And as you can see, there's no particular focal archaeological monument as such here, although there is a, a round barrow up in one corner. But you're looking at a field system and a very thin scatter of Roman pottery sherds, effectively. In fact, the answer to Crawford's question was really staring him in the face because he was, after all, the archaeology officer at the Ordnance Survey. And the Ordnance Survey is really a big part of why British field archaeology developed in the way it did. Because practitioners such as Williams Freeman used Ordnance Survey maps as base documents on which to add archaeological detail. And there was by and large, no equivalent mapping available in other parts of the world. The Ordnance Survey, in turn, kept its maps up to date by constant revision, including its own archaeological field investigators, and sometimes using the work of other um, amateur archaeologists as well. And you note here that Williams Freeman has depicted a few, a few uh, features which do not appear on the Ordnance Survey map. It's not because the Ordnance Survey investigator wasn't aware of them and didn't see them. It's because the Ordnance Survey had very specific rules about um, what they wanted to depict on the maps. Some similar work was undertaken on the continent, um, although contouring was usually preferred to analytical survey, as it was by a significant number of British archaeologists actually. This example is from Sprockhoff's survey of German megalithic sites undertaken in the 1960s and 70s, but including some much earlier surveys. All this work, of course, prior to the 1970s and up until the end of the 1970s really, was necessarily undertaken with optical instruments and traditional surveying tools. Now, some of these optical instruments became very sophisticated, such as the, uh, my favourite, the Vilt RK1 self-reducing Allidade. <laughs> Most wonderful, wonderful piece of kit, isn't it, Jamie? It is. <laughs> the only problem with this was it, it was invented just as the first generation of electronic surveying equipment came available and so became instantly redundant. The first generation electronic surveying equipment uh, that I was aware of at the very beginning of the 1980s was the Citation Electromagnetic Distance Measurer. Some of you may remember an enormous orange box that sat very precariously on top of a tiny optical theodolite and made a noise like sooty and sweep when we were trying to find a target with it. We thought it was absolutely wonderful, and it was for its time, of course. 
um, you, could, you could measure distances over several kilometers to fantastic degrees of accuracy at the press of a button and a little bit of sooty and sweep. But things rapidly moved on, of course. Um, we went from that precarious box balanced on top of a, a theodolite to through the lens total station integrated electronic theodolite and electro distance measurer. Uh, and that was even more wonderful. And then uh, the joys of satellite. Survey grade GPS. Um, absolutely excellent. Uh, really a complete game changer, I think. Uh, and then um, that developed uh, further. We had handheld mapping grade uh, GNSS by now, of course, using all the satellites available, not just the American ones. And what a difference that made. And um, incredible, really, to have in your hand uh, an instrument capable of, of measuring to a few centimetres with, with great confidence. And then, of course, we come on to drones, which are uh, the subject of today's session, and the whole business of photogrammetry, structure from motion, so on and so forth which I will not say any more about because we're going to hear plenty about that in a minute. I'm going to go off sort of slight tangent. Um, I've recently been reading this excellent publication, Remapping Archaeology, published by um, Archaeo Press. Um, I haven't actually finished reading all of it yet, but the papers I've read so far, really excellent, and I would recommend it to anybody. I will just comment on paper in there by Michael Fradley, which contains an awful lot of sound material and useful food for thought. Um, and I feel very positive about it, but <laughs> there is one sentence in Michael's paper which really sets me on edge, and it is this. Archaeotopographical survey is certainly open to accusations of elitism. because there has been a tendency to suggest that only certain people can see the complex subtleties of archaeotopographical features. Now, I can't tell from the context whether Michael believes this himself or whether he's just quoting others. Whatever. It is completely false. I have encountered accusations of elitism before, but they've always come from a sort of pot calling the kettle black kind of situation, so I've always ignored them. This is more specific. Uh, the observation of earthworks is difficult. There's no denying it, but it is not confined to an elite. Anyone can learn it and practice it, and practice it is key and crucial. It does require practice. But this does lead me on to the main point that I wish to make. Archaeological survey, appropriately enough, it seems to me, rests on three legs. Observation, measurement and interpretation. For the remainder of this session, we're mainly going to be talking about measurement. But I would like us to keep in mind that without observation, there can be no measurement and there is no point in measuring anything if you don't interpret it. So the three go together. Now, there's been much psychological research into the mechanics and dynamics of human observation. Some of you will be familiar, perhaps, with the gorillas in our midst experiments. Observation doesn't just happen when you look. We have to look with attention as a positive act. And this is perhaps why Historic England emphasises observation in its technical survey manuals, as you see here. Ninety out of a hundred people looking at this view will see a nice house and some trees. 
the other 10 will also see the earthworks in front of the house. And that's not because they're an elite, it's because they're archaeologists, which is not the same thing. And they will deduce that they're seeing the remains of a formal garden. And to return to Michael Fradley's paper, the question is, how do we integrate the rigorous interpretive skills developed in analytical field survey into the thinking behind the application of these new techniques and the techniques that we're going to be talking about today? And bearing in mind that questions that Sarah has already put before us, I think this is a question that we should keep in our minds this morning. Thank you very much. <laughs>